This conference will now be recorded. Welcome SPC participants. We are here for our January webinar and this may come across slightly different for you all. So if you all have any issues seeing this, please just let us know. We'll make sure that you all can view this in a timely manner. Today, we are getting to have a conversation about some genetics side of this and the different pieces that you all will see and learn about this competition. And we will introduce Randy here a bit more in just a few minutes. But for now, we are going to turn over to Chip and he is going to give you an update on your all's calves and the lot. Great. Thank you, Bailey. Um, so just a, a little heads up, things are going swimmingly well. Um, actually, just received, so if you haven't already, by the time you're listening to this webinar, uh, you can go on to the data sheet and start to see the first round of performance data um, and the billing will be in the works. You, won't have, you haven't received it yet, of course, um, but it's getting really close. So we just received that. So we know a few folks had some questions. In general, cattle have been gaining really well. Uh, they've taken off minimal illness issues at all, a couple minor issues that the yard's trying to be very proactive on. Uh, but the long and the short of it, they, they still feel very good about where we're at. Um, so you know, uh, all your calves are in a singular pin. All uh, of the SPC calves are being fed together. That's adding a um, unique opportunity this year that we haven't had in previous years. And so um, some good things are going on there. In the coming weeks, you'll be getting some pictures, uh, kind of some updates. The weather so far in central Missouri has been remarkable for calves to adjust to a feed yard setting. A little bit of cold snap's gonna come, you know, here in the first couple of weeks of January. But in general, your cattle have had as kind of weather as kind of transition as they could possibly have as we try to see if they can maximize their genetic potential in a feed yard. Hence the reason we have the International Genetic Solutions lead geneticist, Dr. Randy Culbertson. Randy is a New Mexico agriculturalist who has meandered through both the equine world and the bovine world. She, in the last number of years, has completed a PhD at one of the leading animal breeding and genetics groups on the planet at Colorado State. She's been with IGS, which is the genetics arm of Simmental, as we've talked before in this group. Um, she's been with IGS now for, well, we're approaching, give or take, almost three years, I think. We're getting closer to that time frame all the time. So. Dr. Culbertson has a unique perspective. She gets to see on a daily basis the impact of genetic decisions across the database of nearly 20 million head of cattle. That's a unique position and one that uh, makes her uniquely qualified to discuss with you about the genetics and the tools for selection that you all get to use personally for your operations back home at the ranch and as you help your friends and neighbors since many of your seed stock producers. With that, we welcome Dr. Culbertson. We say thank you. The floor is yours. Oh, thanks, Chip. Um, so, hello, everybody. And um, I was asked to give a talk on genetics and, you know, genetic tools for selection. So today what I'm going to talk about is we're going to go to the basics, go down to the beginning, and kind of explain DNA, genetics, how heritability works, um, how inheritance works, and then, you know, kind of lay the ground, the foundation for why the genetic tools we have work for selection. So let's get down to the basics. So starting at the very beginning, DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. It is our genetic blueprint. It is the genetic code that makes us who we are. And every cell in every living being's body has DNA and has that genetic code. So, um, you know, the human DNA, if you took a single strand of DNA and you stretched it out, it would be about three feet long. And so every single cell in your body has this strand of DNA, several strands of DNA. And in order to kind of organize that, they're kept in what's called chromosomes. And chromosomes are just an organization of long strands of DNA 
So each strand is wrapped around proteins called histones, and it's just a way that biology organizes that DNA, because otherwise, if it was just free-floating in those long strands that get tangled up, broken, would not work out very well. But biology has devised a way to organize that DNA in what are called chromosomes. And each chromosome has an arm, it's called a chromatid, and so each chromosome has a pair. So you got one chromatid on this side, another chromatid on the other side. And each person has, you know, that pair, that chromosome pair in every organism. And one chromosome pair is inherited from the sire, the other is inherited from the dam. And that's really important when we think about making genetic improvement and looking at the diversity that we have in a population of animals. It's important to keep in mind that the sire passes on half of their genetics, and that's going to be by passing on one side of this chromosome, where the other side is going to come from the dam. So cattle right now, you know, so cattle have about 30 chromosomes, horses have 32, people have 23. Just to kind of keep in mind the number of chromosomes that each animal has. When um, something happens, like in people, if they end up having more than 23 chromosomes, that's where we see disorders like um, Down syndrome. So, you know, what makes an animal or an organism what it is, part of that is just the number of chromosomes they have and the number, the amount of DNA and that genetic blueprint that each organism has. So with that, some, you know, kind of some basic vocabulary, and I'm sure a lot of you guys have had this in, um, if you've taken high school biology, when you go to college, you're going to have this if you go on a science track. Um, so basic terminology, we have a gene, that's the basic unit of inheritance. Um, we have alleles, and those are alternative forms of a gene. So red versus black coat color, those are alleles. There's a gene that's for red, a gene for black. That The red black portion is what we refer to as an allele. And a lot of times we use gene and allele a, a little bit interchangeably. And locus is the location of a gene on a chromosome. So here we have these um, kind of cartoon um, diagram or pictures of chromosomes. And you see that we have the pair of chromosomes here and we have this location, this locus, and this is where a specific gene is located. So we have a green here and a green and a purple and the green and purple are gonna be the alleles. They're alternative forms of these genes. And you have to have two alleles per locus to be able to express a trait. Um, and some traits, it's only one or two genes in the, you know, in these areas. And but for most traits that are economically relevant, we're going to be looking at thousands of genes. Now, when we consider genes and we talk about the genetic makeup of an animal, we also often refer to their genotype. And the genotype is the, com the combination of genes or alleles that, and it's basically the genetic makeup of an individual. So for example, at a locus A, that's a location on a chromosome, we're gonna just call it A, the possible alleles at that locus are big A and little a. So possible genotypes, we have three options. We have big A, big A, big A, little a, and little a, little a. And a lot of times when we get information and files from um, like Neogen and the DNA companies, they will send us a file that will have the whole, everything that's been sequenced, and it will be in a format similar to this, this format. Um, typically, they'll send it to us in an AB format. So every gene, every allele will have a designation of either A or B. And, um, and when we refer to genotypes, we often refer to them as being either homozygous or heterozygous. So homozygous is going to be identical alleles at one locus. So in our example, that big A, big A, and little a, little a are both homozygous genotypes. Heterozygous genotypes refer to different genes at one locus. That's when we're going to have the big A, little a. When we get files from Zoetis, um, heterozygous would be an AB combination. 
homozygous would be AABB. When we um, go to put that in the evaluation, we um, a lot of times those files, not a lot of times, every time that file is converted so that the computer has a better time, an easier time reading, and we uh, put that in a binary. So these alleles are then um, designated as either one, zero, or one. So at each genotype, if they're homozygous, it's either going to be a negative one or a positive one, and heterozygous is going to be coded as zero. So it's just a way for us to assign what that genotype is for each animal. Now, when we talk about genetics, there are three primary rules that we um, that kind of basically lay the foundation and the groundwork for all the work that we do when it comes to genetics, DNA, and making um, genetic decisions and also establishing genetic tools used for selection. And these laws were established by a monk in the, um, I think it was the 1700s, and he used experiments with pea plants and he established these three laws that we that basically are the foundation for uh, research in genetics. So the first law is the law of segregation. This means that two genes at a locus in the parent are separated. And only one of those genes is inherited from each parent. So we talked about with the chromosome, we have the pairs and um, during the development of gamete genes, so sperm cells and eggs, these uh, these chromosomes are broken apart, and so one gene on one side is, you know, passed on to the offspring. So you get one gene from a parent, from a, the sire, one gene from the dam. The second law, which is my personal favorite, is the law of independent assortment. Genes are segregated independently. So which gene is that is um, separated into which sperm cell is completely random. You're either going to get this chromatid or this chromatid. It's completely random. And that randomness and that independent assortment is where we get genetic variation. So you can have flush mates who have the same sire and the same, same dam, but you're going to see differences in each one of those flush mates. They come from the same genetics from their parents, but due to this law of independent assortment, we see variability. And it's that variability that allows us to make genetic improvement. The third law is law of dominance. This means that some alleles are do dominant over other alleles, which we refer to as recessive alleles. So a little further discussion on dominance versus recessive, so that third law. So dominance is the interaction of alleles at a single locus where one allele masks the expression of the other allele. So we see this a lot in um, coat color or horned cattle. So um, black is considered a dominant gene. So that black is going to mask the um, gene that codes for red. Now, recessive is the interaction of alleles at a single locus that only has one, has phenotypic expression when an organism has two copies of that same allele. So they must inherit recessive alleles from both parents. So here we have a picture where um, the cow is black, her calf is red. So why would we care about dominance versus recessive? Well, this gives us an indication of what the genotypes are for these two animals. So the calf is red, which is a recessive trait. So we know that the genotype for this calf has to have the two recessive genes for red. Now, assuming that this cow is um, the biological dam to this calf, we know since she has, since she herself is black, but her calf is red, she, her genotype has to be black, has to be heterozygous, has one gene for black, has the recessive gene for red, because the only way she could have a red calf is if she is a carrier of that gene. This also gives us an indication of what the genotype the, the bull is. 
So he was either homozygous for red, meaning he had the two recessive genes, or he was heterozygous for, um, for that coat color. So he may have had the same genotype as the dam. Um, so understanding dominance and recessive and how those genes interact with each other can kind of give us an indication of what the genotype is for these animals. And, you know, this is a pretty simple ex um, example, and coat color is a great example of dominance versus recessive. So the example I gave you is what we would refer to as a simply inherited trait. So coat color is simply inherited. This means that this is a trait that's affected only by a few genes. So coat color is an example. Horn um, is another example. Um, but when we look at some of our traits that we use in production, such as weight traits, carcass, calving ease, these are traits we refer to as being polygenic. These traits are affected by many genes, in many cases, thousands and thousands of genes. So genomics has a role to play in both simply inherited and polygenic traits. But for simply inherited traits, it's pretty straightforward because it's only controlled by a few genes. When we start looking into polygenic traits, things start to become more complicated. And that's where our genetic tools um, where we start to, you know, implement genetic tools such as EPDs, because most of our polygenic traits are, are economically relevant traits. And so we want to make genetic improvement on those traits. So like I said, in most cases, polygenic traits are controlled by thousands and thousands of genes and are the most economically relevant tra traits. So how do we make genetic improvement when thousands of traits are involved? It's pretty easy when it's a simply inherited trait. So let's say coat color. If you wanted to, let's say you didn't want any red calves in your herd. Well, it's pretty easy. If we think about that picture of that black cow with a red calf, it's pretty easy to go, well, she's a carrier of that gene. We can remove her. And we can also now use genomics and DNA testing for us to identify those animals with those simply inherited traits because it's pretty easy to identify it on the DNA and to develop a panel to identify those animals. But when we're talking about polygenic traits, we're talking about thousands of genes that all together, the cumulative effect of all those genes result in, you know, a certain weaning weight or yearling weight or marbling score. So how do we make genetic improvement when thousands of genes are involved? And that's where the genetic evaluation in IGS, that's kind of the area that I work in, and that's what we, um, the evaluation, that's where the evaluation comes in. So to understand how we kind of look at these polygenic traits, the first thing I wanna start with is a discussion of what we refer to as the genetic model. And Here's the thing, if you're a geneticist, it's almost like some unwritten rule that you have to have a bell curve in your presentation somewhere. So what is a bell curve? It's this picture right here on the slide. So our x-axis is gonna be whatever trait we're measuring. Let's say it's weaning weight. So it on, it'll be a scale of, let's say zero to a thousand. And on our y-axis is gonna be the number of animals that are at each weight. So in the middle, this highest point is gonna be our average. So the majority of animals are gonna be in this area. And the point of um, what we really wanna do when we look at polygenic traits such as weaning weight is we wanna take this line and this average and we wanna push it forward. So we start to look at these animals here who are kind of above the average so that we can start to push that line to make genetic improvement. So the big thing to think about is when we're talking about genetic improvement, if we do not have genetic variability, you cannot make genetic improvement. It is hardwired into a cow's DNA that she will have four legs, two ears, two eyes. That's hardwired and every cow has the DNA for that. So it's controlled by genetics, but there's no variability in that. Every cow has four legs, every cow has two ears. 
if something occurs that they don't, it's usually an environmental influence or something went horribly wrong. But there's no variability in that. Where there is variability is in weight traits. So we see that, you know, one calf steps on the scale at weaning, he weighs 500 pounds, the next calf weighs 475, the cow after that weighs 525. There's variability in those traits. And because of that variability, we can make genetic improvement. So when we refer to the genetic model, it's a very simple equation. So P represents phenotype. Phenotype is what we see, what is expressed. And so it's coat color, it's the weaning weight of that animal, it's their, um, their ultrasound measurements for carcass, it's the marbling score for calves when they um, are slaughtered. That is their phenotype. In order to get to the phenotype, it takes a combination of both genetics and environment. It's the combination of those two to see the expression of that trait. What we want to focus on is how much of that phenotype is controlled by genetics. Because the environment, we can manipulate quite a bit. I mean, that's, that's management. That's the age of the calf when things were measured. But genetics, that decision was made before that calf was even born. You're making that decision and deciding what genetics do you want to introduce into your cow herd. So we really want to focus on how much of the phenotype is actually controlled by genetics. The environment, we can, you know, those are management decisions. You can make improvements to help improve prove the phenotype, but if the genetics aren't there, you can have the best environment provided and you will only still get mediocre um, performance. You have to have the genetics there to help drive, to help influence this phenotype. And the big thing is how much genetics Im influences that phenotype. So let's take an example here. So we've got two bulls. And essentially, their phenotype is the same. So the first question you need to ask yourself is, are you concerned with the animal's own performance or the performance of his offspring? So when making a decision of which bull you want to use, and this is all the information you have, does this really give you an indication of how his offspring are going to perform? This tells you how he performed, but doesn't really give you much indication of the genetics that this bull has that could potentially influence his offspring. So let's say we do a little research, we dig into these bulls a little bit, and we get a little more information. So now for bull A, we see he's out of a first calf heifer. He was a little older at weaning compared to bull B. Um, bull A was a little younger when his yearling weight was recorded compared to bull B. So, you know, but does this really tell us what the genetic capacity of these bulls are? It tells us their environment. So it does give us a better indication of how this affected their performance, such as their birth weights, their weaning weights, and certain things such as the age of the, the dam and age when um, weight traits are recorded are what we consider to be environmental influences. And we can adjust their weaning weights and yearling weights so that they, we can add, you know, kind of compare them on the same scale. But this still doesn't give us much indication of what the genetic potential of these bulls are. You know, the phenotype is an indication. We do know that some of his genetics is influencing it. But really, we want to know what his potential is as a sire for his progeny. So now I'm going to update this genetic model a little bit, make it a little more complicated for everybody. But now we're going to talk about our phenotype in the context of what I'm going to refer to as a breeding value. So this is basically taking that G part of the previous equation, and now we're looking at the value of an, independent, as, of an individual as a parent. So breeding values are not directly measure, measurable and they're predicted by using the performance data. So it's the performance data of the animal's own performance, his pedigree information, as well as, as these animals get older, the performance of their offspring. 
And we look at a breeding value in the context of it being above or below a population average. So this symbol here, mu, is our population average. And we're looking at the influence of breeding value above and below that population average. And we still have to include environment when we think about that whole combination of what we see in a phenotype. So breeding values, so, you know, here I'm talking about breeding values, but what we actually publish through ASA and from IGS are EPDs. And EPDs are strictly one half of a breeding value. So a parent can only pass on half of their um, genetics to their progeny. And the breeding value is, you know, basically the genetic merit of that parent. So we are really want to focus in on what the progeny difference is. So that's one half the breeding value. So another thing that we um, like to, when we think about genetic selection and genetic improvement, the other thing that we think we um, need to discuss is something called heritability. So heritability is the measure of strength of the relationship between performance and breeding values for a trait. Um, heritability is always represented by an H squared, and um, the equation is pretty simple. It's the genetic variance divided by the phenotypic variance. So what heritability tells us is it says, what is the influence of this genetics on this phenotype? The higher the heritability, means that there's more genetic influence on that phenotype and less environmental. The lower the heritability, the more that that environmental influence can affect that phenotype. Lowly heritable traits we typically see in reproductive traits, stability, those are traits that are heavily influenced by environment. If you don't get your synchronization protocol right, you're probably going to see a drop in heifer pregnancies. And that's an environmental influence, um, not so much a genetic influence. Now, does that mean that you need to put more focus on environment and not think about the genetics for those lowly heritable traits? Not always the case. Because if you don't have the genetics for, let's say, heifer pregnancy, if you haven't been selecting for that, you can provide the best environment possible. But if the genetics aren't there, you're going to have a hard time getting those heifers pregnant. So it's important even for lowly heritable traits and almost more important to really put emphasis on making genetic improvement for those traits because the environmental the environment has an influence but if the genetics aren't there it doesn't matter how great that environment is you're still going to have kind of you know it's going to hinder the performance for that trait So some common um, misconceptions about heritability. High heritability means a high breeding value. That's false. So a high heritability, heritability has to do with the population. It's a measurement for an entire population. So um, let's say uh, dry matter intake, the heritability for that is typically about a 0.4, but um, you know, so that has to do with the whole population of animals. That doesn't mean that their breeding value, their genetic potential, is going to be high. Breeding value is an individual measurement, so it is dependent on each individual animal. So an animal could have a high breeding value for dry matter intake, um, or another animal could have a very low breeding value for dry matter intake. That doesn't mean that the heritability, it, it, the genetics that influence that phenotype has to do with the whole population. The um, genetic potential of that animal is going to be measured by their breeding value, and that's going to be dependent on the individual. Heritability is also not fixed. If I calculate a heritability for Simmental cattle, that's going to be slightly different than if I calculate the heritability for, let's say, Angus. So those, those heritabilities are not, it's not the same from population to population. It's going to be very dependent on the specific population that you measure that or estimate that heritability in. And if it's genetically determined, it must be heritable. 
that's false. Heritability, so I used the example of number of legs. That is determined by the DNA in cattle that they will have four legs. But it also, the number of legs is not, has a heritability of zero, pretty well, or it's non-determined because there's no variability in the number of legs. Now, the length of legs or a frame score, of, we see variability in that. So that would have a heritability, but it's important to remember that we need variability because we're not gonna make genetic improvement on the number of legs. There's no heritability. We are gonna make genetic improvement on frame size or weaning weight or mature weight. There's variability in that. So we want to focus on what the heritability is on that and look to make genetic improvement on traits with variability. So going back to our bull example, we have our two bulls and we, we're gonna look at um, weight traits. So we've got birth weight, weaning weight, and yearling weight. And here we've got heritability of 0.4 for birth weight, 0.3 for weaning weight, 0.4 for yearling weight. So this gives us an indication that, let's say for birth weight, about 40% of what we see in that phenotype is controlled by genetics. That leaves 60% that's controlled by environment. So if you go out and feed those cows pretty heavy, you know, at the tail end of their pregnancy, they're probably gonna on average have some heavier birth weights. And that's because you applied, there was an environmental influence there that helped influence that birth weight. But 40% of that is still controlled by genetics. And those are decisions that are made prior to that calf being born, but will influence the phenotype and how much that calf weighs at birth. So just some takeaways from EPDs. Um, remember that's one half of the breeding value and that's the expected difference between the average performance of an individual's progeny and the average performance of all progeny. So it's an expectation of what we, so for our two bulls, what do we expect to see in performance of all of their offspring? So it's important to remember too that it's, you might see some of his calves do better than another bull that you use for comparison, or you might see some of his calves do worse. And a lot of that has to do with that independent assortment. He has some really great genes and he has some really bad genes. So the genes that get passed on to his progeny, there's gonna be variability in that. But if we took, let's say he had a thousand progeny, if we took the average of that, all those progeny, we could expect it to see how, you know, it's going to be that expected progeny difference tells us if that bull is going to perform better or worse. Um, it's important to keep in mind that EPDs are a tool for comparison. So just taking that bull's EPD alone isn't going to really be very useful, not as useful as when you are comparing him to another bull. So if you're making a decision between two bulls, that's that's really how that EPD is designed to be used, is to make that, in, that comparison. Um, it's also un, important to understand an individual does not transmit its progeny difference to every offspring. So like I said, there's variability in those offspring. So that parent is gonna be passing on some of his, sometimes it's gonna be all the good genes might go to one calf and some of the not so great genes might go to the other calf. So you're gonna see variability. And the EPD is really looking at the overall average of what we expect all of his offspring to, to perform. So how do we establish an EPD? So we're gonna, we have one of these bulls and you know, how do we minimize, or how do we really estimate what's controlled by environment, and to genetics. And that's really what the evaluation is doing. It's really parsing out what's environmental and what's, and what's genetic and assigning that genetic component to each animal and estimating where we expect that animal's progeny and how we expect it to perform. So we're gonna take this animal's own performance and we're gonna take his performance and we're gonna use his information along with all of his pedigree information. We're going to incorporate his DNA, his genomics into the evaluation. 
but we also need to account for what's environmental. So any of these effects that we don't think are genetic, such as age of dam, um, his uh, age when he was weaned and when the, you know, when his weaning weight was measured, all of those things that we, we also need to account for that because we need to establish what environment he was, that was potentially influencing his performance so that we can parse out what's environmental compared to what's genetic. And when we take all of that information together, we put it into um, our computers, we currently are using three machines that are running pretty much nonstop every week to publish EPDs. So currently we are publishing over 20 million EPDs every week. The evaluation starts first thing Tuesday morning and it runs all the way into Sunday evening. So it takes a full week to take all of this information, put it together, and to um, estimate these EPDs. Now, a really important aspect of the evaluation is accounting for environmental differences. So I mentioned some of them is that we have the age of dam that's going to influence traits such as birth weight as well as um, weaning weight. We also want to account the, for the age when these when certain traits such as weaning and yearling weight were measured. Um, but the other thing we want to account for is the environment that that animal was living in. So if it was a great year for rain and there was a bunch of grass, those weaning weights are probably going to be up compared to a year where there was drought. But that's not a genetic influence. So we need to account for those differences from year to year or even differences that we see in pasture. So that's where contemporary grouping becomes really important. We want a, a group of individuals that have experienced similar environments with respect to the expression of that trait. And we use this to remove that environmental influence so we can really get down to what the genetic differences are in animals. And we want to do our best to kind of control for those environmental differences. So the contemporary group is used to separate the environment from the breeding value. And it's used to remove that bias due to differential effects such as management differences. Um, like I said, drought is a great example of how that can influence um, traits such as weaning weight. All those things we want to account for so we can really boil down to what's genetic versus what's environmental. So let's go back to our bull example. So now we have the performance on those bulls. We know information such as their, the age of their dam, the age when they were weaned. We've now accounted for their contemporary groups. We've taken all of this information, their pedigree information, their genomics. We've put all of that into the evaluation. And so now we have EPDs. Great, now what do we do? So now we've got a pretty good idea of where these animals are and what we, how we expect their progeny to perform, which is important because if we're buying a bull, we're buying that bull based on his genetics. We want to know how he's going to influence future generations. So on average, what would the expectation of the progeny for bull A be compared to bull B? Because remember, EPDs are a tool for comparison. So we're going to assume that both of these bulls are bred to genetically very similar cows. So for birth weight, we would take the difference from bull A to bull, to bull B. And we can see bull A's calves will be on average one pound heavier at calving than bull B's. Uh, calving ease, we see that cow, uh, bull A will on average have 6%, 6.5% lower calving ease compared to bull B. Uh, we can see that for weaning weight, bull A's progeny will be nine pounds lighter than bull B's. And same thing with yearling weight, we're gonna see that bull A's progeny will be on average 16 pounds lighter at yearling when yearling weights are taken compared to bull B's. So this gives us an indication of, you know, depending on what your breeding objective is, kind of helps you compare the two bulls and make a decision of which bull might work better for your operation. And we can see that um, bull B is a bull that's got a low birth weight, 
better cavities and you know more growth in his EPDs compared to bull A. So just some quick takeaways for EPDs. EPDs are data driven. The more data, the better the estimation. And the sources of data that we use to establish these EPDs are the animal's own performance, um, the geno his genomics, if we have genomics on that animal, the relative's performance, so that's going to be the pedigree information. The more information we have on relatives, the better we can do with estimating that EPD. And the gold standard is progeny performance. So for bulls, especially AI bulls, we get a lot of progeny information on those bulls so we can do a better job of estimating those EPDs. In the absence of data, so if we have no birth weight record, if we have no phenotype information on a calf, all we know is sire and dam, that EPD is gonna be basically a parental average. It's gonna be the average of those EPDs. But as data starts being submitted on these animals, we're going to start to see those EPDs start to move off of that parental average because the information is going to start to provide us a better estimation of that EPD. Correlated traits can also affect an EPD. So correlated traits are traits such as weight traits. So birth weight has a genetic correlation to weaning weight, has a genetic correlation to yearling weight. And that means that we see that there's genes that affect all three of those traits that are shared across all three of those traits. So if, you, if we get data on a correlated trait, that helps us to estimate the other trait that, like let's say yearling weight. If we get a weaning weight on an animal that because it's genetically correlated to yearling weight, it helps us do a better job of estimating that yearling weight. And last, genomics. Genomics is the equivalent of submitting data on approximately 30 progeny, and it really depends on what trait we're talking about. But the genomics really helps us do just an even better job of estimating that EPD, because genomics will tell us that for sure this animal has these specific genes for this specific trait. So since we know he has those specific genes, we know how those genes influence these traits, then we can do a better job. And like I said, in some cases, it can be the equivalent of having um, progeny records on 30, cap, um, 30 progeny. And this is important for traits that are measured really late in life, like stability. Stability is always a challenge because it's measured so late. So we really want to use those genomics to help us establish that, um, establish what genes, genes those have at, on animals earlier in life so we can it can help us make better predictions for these later, these traits measured later in life. Um, so we publish EPDs, you can go to her book, you can see what EPDs are um, published for which animals. Um, a quick rundown, big thing to think about when we think about APDs are, you know, we publish our APDs, we also publish this additional information. We've got possible change, accuracy, and percentile. And the big number that you really want to focus on is going to be kind of our possible change in our accuracy. That gives you our, the risk level of that EPD that tells you how much data we have on those EPDs. So accuracy is, it's basically the relationship between the animal's EPD and the true EPD. It's the estimation of accuracies that tell us how reliable is that EPD. The higher the accuracy, the more reliable an EPD. And it, you know, it basically gives us an indication of how accurate that EPD is based on the information provided. Accuracies increase as more information is submitted. So younger animals are going to have a lower accuracy compared to older animals. Genomics is a method to improve that accuracy on younger animals. Just like I mentioned for traits that are measured later in life, genomics can really help us do a better job of estimating that earlier on on life. So you can make those decisions later rather than having to wait further on to, you know, to see how that animal is actually going to perform. 
So EPDs for animals with low accuracy, you can expect those EPDs to change as animals, as more data is submitted. Um, sometimes it stays right on point, but sometimes you'll start to see some movement as we get more information. So big question is genomics. Is genomics the game changer or not? So as we've had advancements in technology, especially computing power, this has allowed us for the inclusion of genomics into genetic evaluations. And, you know, as we've made advancements and have better understanding of DNA and how genes work, this also allows us to start to incorporate that information. You know, genetic helps, genomics helps us improve prediction and accuracy. It allows us to do parent verification. So if we have a mistake in the pedigree, that's gonna affect those EPDs. So genomics helps us verify to make sure that we do have the correct parents for animals and that we have the correct pedigree information. Um, it also helps us identify for simply inherited traits such as horned or coat color, as well as some um, diseases uh, genomics can really help us see if there's a bull that's a carrier for some deleterious traits. Um, and it also identifies markers for specific traits. So like I said, then genomics helps us identify that for sure this animal has the genes that really contribute and help improve traits such as weaning and yearling. Now for polygenic traits, genomics only actually account for a percentage of genes explained or genes involved in the expression of that trait. So for example, weaning weight. Say we get genomics on this animal. It's that genomics is probably only gonna account for maybe 5% of the variability that we see in that gene. So although genomics can really help us do a better job of prediction, it's not that silver bullet. We still need phenotypes to be recorded because the phenotype and progeny performance is really the gold standard. Now, genomics helps tremendously, but it's not that gold, it's not that silver bullet. So we still need phenotypes and, you know, all the data that we were traditionally um, reporting before genomics, we still need that information. So the big thing is data collection is key. A genetic evaluation is only as good as the data that is being submitted. Um, the more accurate your data collection is, it will lead to more a more accurate measure of an animal's performance and how they perform compared to their contemporaries. So the better your data submission is, it's just the better your the EPDs you're going to get in the end. So my big take home is if you don't measure it, you can't improve it. So that goes along with data collection. If you are not um, measuring your weaning weights, you don't know if you're making genetic improvement on your weaning weights. You have to measure it so that you can make those improvements. Some quick recaps on EPDs. What are EPDs? They're genetic prediction of progeny performance. How do you use EPDs? They're a tool for comp comparison of animals on a genetic level. When do you use EPDs? When genetic improvement for the next generation is your goal? And why? Very simply put, it's for genetic improvement. Um, so that's what I have for today for um, DNA, EPD, genetic tools for um, selection. If anybody has any questions, please feel free to shoot me an email or Chip or um, Bailey, and um, they also know how to reach me. So, thanks. I appreciate you guys tuning in. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Culberson. Um, it just so happens I have a few questions sitting on my desk, if you don't mind, and so I'm going to share those with you real quick. But okay. I, I think I'd speak for Bailey and Dr. Atkins, who couldn't be with us on this call. This is going to be one of the more serious conversations we have during our monthly webinars for the SVC. This is, by the makeup of most of you all who are involved, this is something that's very important to you. It's something you're very passionate about. And so I would strongly encourage you, especially for our high school age and college age students, 
go back and listen to this talk a couple times. Um, every single slide has a lot of meat to it. And I'll be honest, I've heard a lot of different folks give a lot of different conversations um, and an overview, overviews of genetics. But Dr. Culberson does a tremendous job of laying it out in a way that's uh, available to us, in a way we can take it up. But still, there's a lot of stuff there. So don't hesitate to watch this a couple times. Um, if you're younger, get mom or dad or older sibling in the room. Hey, take this to your ag advisor at school. That person's always looking for a lesson to talk about these things through, or your 4-H club. This is this is serious content put in a way that we can that we can absorb it. And so I say thank you. Um, so my questions: one, I, I really appreciated Dr. Culberson kind of mentioned there at the end. As much as DNA and genomics are crucial, it's not the silver bullet. There there are more pieces you have to solve. But I am going to ask this, a handful of questions. A couple of them are going to be fairly targeted at DNA because they're the things that we hear a lot of. So um, when I submit, and you, you did actually touch on this, but I want to hone it in a little tighter. So, and this might go back to your uh, law of independent assortment that you talked about. But when I submit a DNA sample, why is it that my uh, EPDs don't always go up. Why don't they always get better? I turned in more information. Well, it's important to remember an EPD is an estimation of how we expect the progeny to perform. So just because you submit data doesn't mean your EPD is going to go up. It's going to go up or down depending on the information coming in. So with genomics, and uh, you know, I've gotten this question before too, of well, I submitted DNA. Why didn't my EPD get better? Well really your EPD got better. It doesn't, but better means that we're doing a better job of estimating it. It doesn't always mean that the number is going to go in the direction you want. It is, it could go one way or the other. And so that level of accuracy tells us, you know, we have so much information going in, but there's still going to be some changes as more information comes in. And DNA, like I said, in some traits, that could be like sending in 25 records on progeny. So that's a lot of information coming in and it starts to say, okay, we know this because of the DNA, we know this animal has these specific genes that could potentially be passed on to offspring. But so now we can start to, to kind of zero in where that EPD is really gonna be because we have all this information coming in. Sometimes the EPD goes up, sometimes the EPD goes down. And that is, unfortunately it is, has to do with just a little bit of that randomness of inheritance for genes. And um, I wish I could say it would always go up as you submit DNA, but I wouldn't be doing a very good job if, I, if that was the case. So sometimes it goes up, sometimes it goes down. So I actually think this is a pretty important take on the fact of how do we see genetic information or EPDs? Um, is it a marketing tool? Yeah, to some extent it is, but the bigger thing is the goal is to get the right information, the correct, accurate information so we can make responsible breeding decisions, right? And so those of us, we all have to market a little bit. So yeah, we'd like that all to get better. But to your point, we want the more accurate, the more correct answer. And that, again, because of that randomness may not always go up. So I appreciate that. And, and young folks who are listening, I assure you that's a topic that mom or dad's probably had curiosity about in the past. So I know if history tells me anything, they're looking over your shoulder and listening. So mom and dad, um, please take note of, of that answer. Um, as you know, one of the things that Dr. Culberson is, is somewhat unique with the American Simmental Association opposed to other breed associations is our members own their genotypic information, right? Our members own uh, their genotypes. Um, now, realistically speaking, as you've kind of described, there's not a lot somebody can do with that unless you have access to some of the tools and knowledge that you have, but they do own their genotypes. Um, on rare occasion, somebody says, I want my genotype. Can you prepare them if they're adamant about getting that genotype, which is theirs, and they can certainly have it? What are they going to receive? And just prepare them what they're going to be looking at when they get that. Yeah. So 
keep in mind a strand of DNA is billions and billions and billions and billions and billions of base pairs. And so when we go through, let's say you do a panel, let's say you do a 50K, you're going to get this um, results file. And like I said, it's going to be basically every genotype for 50,000 genes. And you're going to get this file. Um, you can attempt to open it up in Excel. Your computer will probably crash if you try to do that um, because you're going to get all of that information in every single gene. It's going to come through and it's going to be an A and a B um, or it'll be a negative one, zero, one. So that's going to be what, what you would get. If, so if you wanted, if you were really wanted to get that, the results from your DNA test, you spent your money, you want to see what those results are, we are happy to send it to you. But just keep in mind, it's not going to make a lot of sense. It's not going to be very usable outside of the context of the genetic evaluation we have computers it's spent we are computers we have very fast computer computers very sophisticated computers it takes them a full day to get that genetic information into a format that we can use into the evaluation now we're doing you know that's over 350,000 animals that we're doing that for but it's it is a lot so if you um for you to take those genotypes unfortunately out of the context of the evaluation there's not a lot of value to those you you it you know we end up having to kind of um, what we call impute so we get all those genotypes on the same level and then we feed that into the evaluation so if you open up a spreadsheet with those genotypes it's going to be a bunch of a's and b's and probably the very first line might give you the chromosome location, the loci, the locus of where those genes will be, and you will get a bunch of ABs. So um, we're more than happy to send it to you if that's what you want, but just be aware that that's what's gonna happen when you try to open that up and it'll probably crash your computer pretty quick. Yep, just, just wanted to get that out there because that is a common question, as you know. Um, one more question on my desk and you touched on that each parent passes on half of the genetic makeup is it always exactly 50 percent uh yes in the context of what we're talking about it's going to be yes so they're going to inherit one gene from a parent another gene from the other parent um, okay. There are some other things that we talk about in the genetic evaluation where we talk about um, maternal effects, um, where we're going to have, we're going to see the dam is going to provide a certain environment for that, but she's not really passing on those genes. She's providing an environment that she's got a genetic propensity for. But, you know, for the context of genetic improvement, it's going to be you know, 50% is coming from the sire, 50% is coming from the dam. And my last commentary, and then I'll turn it over to, to Bailey, um, if she has any comments or questions, really appreciated the heritability conversation. That's one that is, is fairly confusing for a lot of folks. And so, again, I, I would encourage folks in particular to go back and kind of listen through that section. I think it's something that most of us don't think about enough. So I throw that out there. With that, Dr. Culbertson, I say thank you. Ms. Abel, I turn this back over to you. I shall be quiet. Ms. Elaine, I do have one more quick question. So, you, I apologize, step back a little bit. I'm going to kind of off this first question, but for someone to hear so let me i'm going to repeat the question just to make sure i have it so the question is oh can, can you hear me now yes now i can <laughs> i apologize my speaker was messed up a little bit there so going back to chip's first question for you a bit 
And for some of these participants who this might be their first exposure to some of the, the genetic and the DNA and the EPDs a bit more, how does a producer directly influence their accuracy? If, if these kids are looking at their weaning weights on their calves that they're seeing, um, what does a producer specifically have to provide that data um, to make that accuracy go up? Um, so, you know, the things that influence accuracy, it's going to be um, the animal's own performance. Um, it's going to be pedigree information, um, progeny information, and genomics. So if you want the biggest bump, so you have a young animal and you want to get a pretty quick jump up in accuracy, genomics. DNA the animal, submit that an, that information. That's going to give you, it's probably going to give you about a 0.3 increase in accuracy pretty, pretty quick off the bat. Um, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, somewhere in there. Now, as more data gets submitted on those animals, so the animal's own phenotype is going to contribute and increase that accuracy as well. Um, you know, in, in most cases, what we see now, most of the parents are usually, both parents are usually known on both of those, um, um, most animals information that's coming in. On occasion, we'll get an animal with an unknown let's say an unknown dam or unknown sire, that would affect it too. So make sure you have accurate pedigree information coming in as well. But really the quickest way off the bat to get that accuracy to jump up is going to be genomics. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. So Chip, if you don't have any more questions and if Randy doesn't have any more last comments, I would like to touch on the kids assignment real quick um, you all will be receiving the email per the normal um, schedule. You'll be getting that on this Tuesday that you're listening to this webinar, hopefully, or a couple days before you may be listening to this webinar. You will be doing a couple different, you have a couple different options this month. So one option for those of you who have not participated before is one that previous particip participants have very much enjoyed. Uh, you are going to be collecting the DNA from some fruit, and so we'll walk you through how to do that. It won't be anything too difficult. Just a, a few household supplies in a little time, you'll get to have some fun extracting some DNA for yourself, just like they'd be doing on your calves in the DNA lab to pull that DNA out. The second option, for those of you who maybe have already done the um, fruit DNA extraction exercise or you want to do something different, your second option is going to be tracking genes and some hered heritability in cookies. So you all are going to make some gingerbread or sugar cookie or pick your favorite type of sugar of cookie in cow form. And you all are going to, depending on your age level, decorate and plan and design those cookies along with their genotypes and their phenotypes. And you're going to explain some of what you learned in this webinar through that assignment with your cookies. So those are going to be your assignment options and we'll get that full information out to you. And that'll be due the Friday after this webinar goes out per the normal schedule. So if there's nothing else, then I think we are good to wrap up. Any last comments, Chip? Uh, if I get cookies and they're good, uh, extra credit's possible, I'm guessing. Perfect. Well, thank you very thank much. You. Well, enjoy your the holidays were great. Yes, enjoy your week participants, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you, guys. Thank you.